Hub Hopper Originals. To start your podcast for free, log on to studio.hubhopper.com. Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Cheats. Our guest today is an astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and is also the author and editor of the Jonathan Space Report. He has a BA in mathematics from Churchill College and a PhD in astrophysics from the Institute of Astronomy both at the University of Cambridge. He has also spent a year at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and returned to Cambridge, Massachusetts where he currently is involved as a staff member at the Chandra X-ray Center. He also conducts research into the history of space flight and interestingly he also has an asteroid named after him in 1993 more than all that i have just spoken to you about our guest today is an excellent science communicator and that is going to be evident to you as we get into and present an indian genes exclusive and a very special conversation with a special person we now bring you jonathan mcdowell so jonathan from everyone at indian genes it's an absolute pleasure to have you here and i hope that you're going to be spending your time well with us we have a lot of questions for you it's a huge topic but let me start with welcoming you to indian genes thank you very much it's great to be here great and we're going to be trying to tap into every part of your expansive experience and everything that you've been doing with space exploration but before we get there jonathan how did this all start for you and if you could let us into what started this excitement for you well i really come to it a couple different ways there 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 are two main threads to my interest in space one is the big where do we all come from how did the universe evolve what about black holes and things like that and that for me came out of a, a philosophical interest which is a very fancy word to use for for an interest when i was like 10 or 11 uh, mm-hmm. wondering about you know what is this place we live the world and 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 where do we come from but the other really critical thing and my interest in in uh space exploration and satellites and and so on uh that really came from project apollo and the first landings on the moon and i was 9 years old when uh Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. Well, wow. uh and the year before I actually spent at NASA. My dad was a physicist and so we were at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center uh uh the year before the moon landing so I was a 7-year-old 8-year-old and uh, running up and down the corridors of uh, all the nice. space scientists and annoying them. So um that was uh you know that that kind of got me in. and the moon landing blew my mind and it hasn't got non blown since and so that's really uh mm. what, what sent me down that road amazing because yes the moon landing for all of us uh, was the event that got us started and you said your dad was a physicist as well did he did he in any way other than uh influence you with what he was doing push you in any direction or did he just let you be and then you by default or because of what was happening around you he get he, he, he pushed me really hard to be like a doctor or a lawyer or something that would actually earn money and and away from physics and i i i and he wasn't you know he he did a sort of atomic physics that was very more practical and that didn't really excite me uh so it was more that i grew up in physics departments that mm-hmm. it was the other people around the, the fact that all my babysitters were physics graduate students you know that <laughs> uh, i think yeah. i just didn't realize there was another career option um but but it was more being exposed to uh ideas about space uh that uh that then you know caught my imagination and being in a physicist family gave me some advantages in 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 you know having resources to learn to meet people and to to learn how to go the academic route and so that mm. of course is always a big advantage if you know how to work the system i think uh, the right term to 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 use on you would be the chronicler of the space age right and i think that that is 
what we see when we look at all your work and especially the detailed work that you've been doing with tracking the Starlink satellites. We'll probably get to that a little bit later. And Jonathan, if we could start at when we talk about space, so before we can even get into space, an interesting the definition for us here would be how would or where would you define space? Because when we talk about aircraft or commercial aircraft flying at 35,000 uh, feet, uh, they're still within within a particular distance. But if we could, in perspective, for you, where would you define space starts? Right. And I've actually written a paper on this. Um, when I started making my big chronicle of space events, I had to decide what counted as a space event and so yeah. that uh, yeah. uh so i dug really deep into this and and uh so what i concluded to you know jump to the answer is is that uh, space begins about 80 kilometers above the surface of the earth and there are a couple of ways you can come to that and just to you know so so you have airplanes that you might have been on that fly at at you know of order 10 kilometers uh, maybe 12 uh, and that's just at the edge of the lowest physical layer of the atmosphere, the troposphere, uh, mm. which is where we all live and spend our lives. And then above that, people have mostly heard of the stratosphere, uh, which is this sort of thinner layer that is between about 12 kilometers and 50 kilometers. And that's, you know, uh, fighter jets and things fly in the stratosphere uh, and some of the higher uh, long distance passenger planes. And then as you get above that, there's a kind of no man's land called the mesosphere, uh, mm. which uh, uh, is between 50 and about 80 kilometers. And that's sort of the highest layer that's really still atmosphere, uh, uh, but it's pretty thin. And once you get above 80, for a number of reasons, I, uh, um, uh, I consider that you're really in space. And, and satellites... Can't, uh, can't survive in the mesosphere. They they can get down to 80 kilometers, but then they burn up if they go below that. Mm. And airplanes and air breathing things can't really get above the stratosphere. Um, uh, even the uh, the very highest, surprisingly, it's you can actually go higher in a balloon than you can in a jet. Mm. Uh, if you have a super big balloon, it can get up to about 50 kilometers, but not higher. And and so so all the air uh, propulsion stuff is is in that stratosphere and below, and the space stuff is above eighty. That's interesting, and that sets in perspective most of what we'll be talking about later. So people listening to us understand when we use these terms during the conversation. Now, uh, Jonathan, for you, all this would have during your chronicles would have probably started technically in nineteen. 57 maybe when uh, things changed right with sputnik sputnik and was would... the first orbital launch yes although mm. we were already launching things into space before then on on suborbital shots and mm. and actually you know the uh, uh the awkward thing right that we have to acknowledge and and deal with is that space exploration really began in 1942 with the first Nazi ballistic missile. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, the subject was born in sin, if you like. The uh, 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 the Werner von Braun, uh, working for the Nazis, uh, launched the A-4 rocket uh, to about 90 kilometers or so in 1942. Mm. And, and that was used as a missile to send high explosive warheads uh, uh, um, to smash in on Paris and London. Uh, but after the war, the same missiles were used for the very first space science experiments to carry uh, uh, scientific uh, measurement devices up above the atmosphere and begin the space science that we can continue today. Uh, both, uh, uh, you know, so the Americans captured von Braun and some of the V2s, and they went to New Mexico and fired those. And the Russians captured some uh, uh, and went to uh, near Volgograd and and fired them there. Uh, and so, so both the American and Russian space programs grew out of that Nazi missile program, and that's uh, that's something we have to confront. Mm, that's so interesting because you are telling us that before militarization, it Probably there's a difference here. That's your weaponization, right? 
Right, exactly. The space, the military have been in space uh, from the beginning, and even with the satellites, right? Um, uh, the uh, uh, yes, the first few satellites were doing scientific research, even if the military were involved. Uh, Explorer One, the first American satellite, was launched by the U.S. Army before NASA existed, uh, and uh, uh, but very close behind came the CIA's satellite program. Uh, whose mission was to take pictures of of Russia from space, and so so yeah, there's been military in space uh, since the beginning. That's not new, but it's been in a support role, spying, communications, navigation, not for the most part weapons. And so we are mm -hmm. still trying. Those of us who are supporters of peace, we're we're still trying to limit the uh, military activities in space and prevent it going towards actual armed conflict. Mm. And when we talk about satellites and now that we've understood where this is going to be launched, when this is going to be launched, could you give us some kind of an easy way of understanding the types of probably satellites and how far they go? And we can then come to Starlink and, and what are the current issues we do have with space debris. But what is the current scenario? Because we do hear a lot about space junk, if I can use that word. Uh, there are a lot of concerns. Are you concerned? And how, how do you see this? Yeah, I, I think uh, space junk or orbital debris, if you want to be more formal, uh, is, is starting to be a huge problem in space. And uh, Perhaps I better start off just by reminding people what being in orbit is. Because it's not enough just to go up into space if you if you launch a rocket up even 500 kilometers, uh, it'll fall back down again. Hmm. What a space satellite does is the rocket goes up a couple hundred kilometers, and then, and that takes it maybe just a couple of minutes, uh, and then the rocket heads sideways, horizontally, and builds up speed for another 10 minutes or so, until it's going at about 25,000 kilometers an hour. Well, and uh, it's uh, uh, at that point, the rocket engine switches off and, the, and you allow the satellite to fall. But it's going so far sideways that by the time it has fallen a mile or a kilometer, it's gone so far around the Earth that the round Earth is curved away from it by the same amount and it never gets any closer. And so it just falls around the Earth. And that's the same way that the moon falls around the Earth and never gets any closer. And so the trick is having this big sideways velocity. But we haven't said anything about which direction that velocity is in. It's got to be horizontal, but it can be north or east or west. And so you have all of these satellites all going at 25,000 kilometers an hour. And... Uh, um, you're uh, and you're going, but they're all going in all different directions. And mm -hmm. so if they come close to each other, right, you're uh, uh, you you're going in slightly different directions at at uh, enormous speeds. And so if you have a piece of space junk that's left up there, or even just a dead satellite, right, once the satellite stops working, it doesn't fall out of the sky because it's got this enormous velocity. It just keeps on going round and round and round. And yeah, eventually it will come down if it's in a low orbit because the Earth's atmosphere actually, despite what I said earlier, doesn't just sort of sharply cut off at 80 kilometers or anywhere else. There's a tiny bit, even hundreds of kilometers up, that will uh, be a headwind that slows the satellite down and makes it spiral in and, and burn up. But that can take years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and if it's a high enough orbit, it can take centuries. And so you've got all of this stuff that's just left over and dead, and it stays up there, uh, and it's whizzing around in all directions, and so you better be ready to dodge. Mm. And none of these decompose in any way, or is there any plan to, is there even a possibility that that can be looked at? Yeah, so, um, you know, the... There's some slow degradation that happens uh, because of sunlight on the materials uh, that that is actually bad, right? Because it means 
pieces of insulation flake off and become separate pieces of space debris. Mm. Um, and then, of course, we're, now we're getting to the regime where things are, you know, little pieces. There's, so, you know, we, we track about 20,000 pieces of stuff in Earth orbit. Uh, mm. And that's in low orbit, we can get everything down to about 10 centimeters. But there's lots of pieces of debris that are even smaller than that, that are one centimeter or even a millimeter. And we mm. think there might be as many as a billion pieces wow. uh, down to a millimeter. And even, you know, a millimeter, yeah, a millimeter sized piece of metal, if it hits you, you think no big deal. But if it's going at 25,000 kilometers an hour, it's still really going to sting. It's going to leave a hole in you. Mm. Uh, and so so there's all of this stuff up there that is, um, you know, eroding satellites just from uh, uh, shooting it. And, uh, and then the bigger stuff that could cause real major damage if it hit you. Uh, and, and, and it slowly, you know, in low orbits, the atmosphere cleans things out on a 20 year time scale or so and higher orbits, it really is a long-term problem. And, and we're going to have to do something about it. We're going to have to, uh, have space garbage trucks that go up and collect the material and dump it in the Pacific, uh, or, uh, and we're also going to have to regulate, you know, there, there, there are companies now that want to put up these big constellations of internet satellites. Mm. And a couple of years ago, there were only a thousand working active satellites, right? 20,000 pieces of junk, 1,000 working satellites. Now there mm. are 4,500 working satellites and there are plans that the various companies have for up to 100,000 satellites. Well, and and so just enormously more traffic. We're going to have to regulate that. We're going to have to say, OK, no, you can only have so many satellites in that orbit, so many satellites in that. Orbit. It's just getting out of hand. Well, you mentioned something very interesting. I want to go back to where you said space junk trucks. And how are we how do you visualize that? Or what is the idea there? So the idea there is that the biggest risk is actually not from the 20,000 little pieces in the short term. It's from mm. the mm, couple hundred or so biggest pieces and old 10 ton Soviet rocket stages and things like that. Uh, and so what you would do is you would go up with a satellite to one of these rocket stages and clamp onto it somehow and people are still figuring out what the best way is, is to do that uh, and then use up some fuel to change the satellite so that, you know, if it's going at a certain speed, right, uh, uh, that I was talking about this, this 25,000 kilometers an hour, maybe it's in an orbit that is a circular orbit where the, uh, you know, the high point is, let me just take an example of like the space station, which is at, you know, maybe 420 kilometers at its high point and 405 kilometers at its low point, so so almost mm. circular. Um, if you get it at its high point and slow it down by just a few hundred kilometers an hour, now the other side of the orbit, its low point isn't going to be 405 anymore. It's going to be mm. like 40. It's going right. to be inside the atmosphere. And so by slowing it at its high point, half a trip around the earth uh, about uh, 45 minutes later uh it's going to enter the atmosphere and burn up mm. uh and and so that is feasible unfortunately you might need a separate junk truck for almost every satellite because uh it's very expensive in fuel to go from an orbit that's tilted uh to the equator one way versus another way uh, so some satellites are going over the poles some satellites are going around the equator some satellites are going at an intermediate latitude uh, uh, from a certain degree north to a certain degree south uh, and uh, and to switch between those isn't practical uh, in terms of fuel so you'd have to launch separate uh, junk trucks for those different orbits so it's going to mm -hmm. be expensive right uh, and uh, and it's not clear how we're going to fund it uh, mm. And it's not clear legally how, for example, you would arrange for um, 
an American or even an Indian space garbage truck to go up to a Russian satellite, even a dead Russian rocket stage, and get rid of it without, you know, causing an international incident. And mm. and so there's a lot of politics to be worked out, and there's a lot of technology to be worked out. But I think we're going to have to do it. Right. And when you said earlier that all these satellites are in orbit, and what you plan to do, or what you're visualizing here, is you're kind of deorbiting them to get them out of that fixed orbit and then move out. That that's exactly right. You want to deorbit them. You want to you want to send the bit at least the big stuff. Uh, you want to send it down so that uh, it hits the atmosphere at these enormous speeds, speeds, and then it bursts into a fireball and melts, and you know, uh, uh, and then it isn't a problem to anyone else. Okay. And is this something that I, I've heard about uh, Clear Space? I think it's a ESA ESA project. Is this in in the same lines with what we are talking, or is there another plan there? There's a whole bunch of different plans. Yeah, ESA has this Clear Space project. You're right. Um, there's there's a, a, a Japanese British company called Astroscale that's doing some experiments right now in orbit. Uh, there's a British company called Surrey Satellite that has done some experiments, uh, and so uh, and and the Chinese have done an experiment, although they haven't said much about it. Um, uh, so uh, surprisingly, the action has come from like the, these sort of more recent space players, and not you know the the U.S. and Russia uh, have, even though they generated most of the junk have not really stepped up to do anything practical on this yet. Mm. True. And and that is what would be needed because you were talking about if you had to move, for example, a Russian satellite or a, or a Russian piece of debris out of the way. I guess even if it's from like 30, 40 years ago, Russia as a country or Soviet Union at that time, they would still have some compliance or, or legal permission that you would have to first seek from them right and that can that can take time or that has to be worked out that's exactly right and and it's very sensitive because uh okay fine they may not care about this old piece of junk but what if they have an old satellite that's sort of got a secret payload on it and so they may not want to establish the precedent that uh uh you know you can go and look at uh, uh, uh our satellites that appear to be dead um, and, and so it's, it's, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit unclear. I, I, you know, the space lawyers that I know are, are really worried about this. I, I feel it's got to be, it's such a no brainer that we've got to get rid of this junk that it's got to be solvable and, mm. uh, and it really shouldn't be that big a deal. Uh, and so I hope that when it comes to the point of, of actually doing it, everyone will, will work together and be happy about it. Um, but uh, but we'll see, uh, you know, and it's usually I mean, this thing, right, is an environmental problem. Mm. And like every other environmental problem that humanity faces, um, you know, people figure they don't have to worry about it until it's already kind of too late. Mm. And and so we're now getting into that stage of it's getting bad enough that people are going to have to start actually doing something. Right. It's interesting you said it's an environmental problem because we started off with defining space. And for some reason, we do have a lot of environmental activists who are doing uh, amazing jobs here on Earth. But uh, we don't seem to assume or, or, or feel that space is part of the environment because in our minds, the environment is just as close as you can be because it's the weather and, and how it affects your immediate uh, life. Right. But I mean, space is part of the environment, but do you see that that is not being taken as part of the environment? I think there's an evolving understanding now that it is. Um, and you talk about things affecting your everyday life, and I think people don't understand how much space affects their everyday lives. Hmm. Uh, I mean, it affects it because you look up at night into the sky and you see the constellations. And... Uh, if you can't make out the constellations because there are too many satellites going overhead, uh, that's a change to your environment. Uh, but also, I would say, if your GPS were to stop working, that would be a big change to your environment that would really get your <laughs> oh, attention. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, so, and that's all coming from space, right? And so, yeah. um, and so we all depend 
on space in very practical ways now on space technology, as well as, you know, we're all in space, right? The Earth is in space and you're on the Earth, so you're in space. Uh, and uh, the uh, um, we see the sky, we uh, uh, it has an effect on us, even if it's subtle. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, I, 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 I mean, another critical environmental aspect of all this, right, is a lot of the information we get about climate change actually comes from satellites hmm. because climate change is not so much about, you know, the individual flood that you may have in your town or the individual storm that you have. It's the changes to the global earth atmosphere system as a whole, right? Uh, it's the whole world uh, that's being uh, affected in interacting in, in different ways. And so you need to take a global view and watch what's going on because, you know, it may be unexpectedly cold where you are, but that's because that heat moved somewhere else and it's super hot there. Uh, and so satellites give us that global view of the Earth that let us figure out the overall impact of climate change. And so they're absolutely critical uh, uh, to our own future. Mm. There, if you look back, at history and we look back currently as well, I come from an aviation background, we probably are talking about operating procedures for space because, uh, for example, ATC or air traffic control, the amount of traffic that it is navigating and controlling as we speak. But that has to be solved by what you said just before this and, and countries coming together. But I would then say that there is a financial drive there, right? So then people come together to get it done. At the moment, space or space debris or we you just said that it's going to go to 100,000 uh, satellites in the near future Th at some point we are going to realize that it is imperative that we start <laughs> space controlling most of the stuff that's right yes so what happens right now if my satellite comes close to your satellite is that if the u.s space force has our emails they're going to send us a message going we see that, that you guys are getting close to one another, one of you might want to move. Uh -huh. uh, but what they don't do is what an air traffic controller would do and go, oh, you know, Joaquin, move up one kilometer, or Jonathan, move down one kilometer, right? They, they don't tell you who moves where uh, mm. because, you know, they're the U.S., and if you're Indian or Chinese, you're going to go, oh, you don't tell me what to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so we really, if we, we're going to have air traffic control for space, it needs to be international uh, for people to buy in. And, and we're just not there yet. And so I think that's, that's a challenge for the coming years. Mm -hmm. And as an astronomer coming to uh, the current satellites that are orbiting, and we can come to Starlink now, how much of what Starlink is doing currently affects your work and how do you tackle this because you're looking out in space i assume the different types of telescopes some of us look through individual telescopes but the kind of research that you are doing you'd probably be covering bigger areas in space right so how would you give us an understanding of the starlink issue at the moment i can call it an issue because it's there now right although there's only about you know a little over a thousand of them up right now one to, one to 2,000, and we're talking about having 30,000. And so that's when it starts to get bad. Um, and it's not just Starlink. Uh, there, there are other internet satellite constellations going up. One of them is called OneWeb, hmm. which is actually uh, British-owned but also partly Indian-owned. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and that one's worse for astronomers because it's in a higher orbit, so you can see and them that's over gonna a wider be, area. That's going to be 48,000, I think, right? Well, they've actually, uh, that was the original plan. I'm glad to say uh, their latest filing has reduced that to about 7,000. You know, that they may well want to put up a second generation that's a bigger number, so we'll, we'll see. All, all of these numbers uh, are going back and forth right now. It's hard to pin them down. Uh, but yeah, so so OneWeb uh, and Starlink, and then there's uh, uh, Amazon is going to put up its own constellation, and uh, uh, China has a constellation called Guanwang that they're starting to talk about, uh, and so we're going to see all of these different companies 
uh, dotting the sky. So at the moment, right, what what happens is, yeah, we're definitely seeing in a, when we take a when we take a picture of the sky. If I'm trying to find um, uh, measure the mass of a, a distant galaxy to, and study the black hole in it. Um, uh, this is an incredibly faint, distant thing that I'm looking for. And mm. so I take a, a picture on a big telescope, enormous telescope, that may take me, uh, you know, I don't, I don't just go click like you might do with your cell phone camera. I maybe take a 10 minute exposure. And uh, during that 10 minutes, if a satellite comes across, I get a big streak across my image. And so that streak blots out part of the picture. Uh, and yeah, you can use software to kind of cosmetically remove the streak mm -hmm. to make it the picture look prettier. But I'm trying to measure things to sort of a 1% accuracy. I want to know the brightness of this particular star is, you know, uh, 15.38 plus or minus 0.01. And so one, once the streak has been through that part of the image, there's a kind of scattered glow. If you subtract it, it's, it's still uncertain. You've, you've sort of destroyed the, uh, the fidelity. Um, you've added some noise. And, and so uh, it, it can actually degrade the science that you get out of your observation. Uh, and uh, there, it can even, you know, have effects on the electronics of the camera if the streak is bright enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, used to be that you would occasionally get one of these satellite streaks, but they were rare enough that you just sort of chalked it up to a bad day and you had enough other data that it was fine. Now we're seeing them more and more. And when these constellations are fully deployed, you might expect every image to be affected by a streak on average wow. uh, and some to have several streaks on, which makes it very hard to get any science out of the, out of the image. Uh, and, and so, uh, and so it is going to be a challenge. Uh, I would say not to overstate it that So in the middle of the night in winter, probably most of the satellites in the lower orbits like Starlink won't be illuminated. And so they won't be a problem. The higher orbit, well, in the in the summer, uh, the higher orbit ones like OneWeb will be illuminated all night long, and so we're going to get streaks all the time. But the problem is much worse if you are observing things near the horizon in the mm -hmm. early part of the evening, as as the sun has just set. What astronomers call twilight, although astronomer twilight is everyone else's night, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah. uh, um, we don't consider it really night until yeah. a couple hours after everyone else does, uh, right? Because we, yeah. we're trying to get the sky really dark. So in astronomer twilight, um, you've got it's dark outside. You can do science, but you've got many more satellites illuminated uh, and there's some science that you can only do in that period. I, for me, as a distant galaxy black hole astronomer, I tend to want the middle of the night when it's mm. really dark. But my friends who are looking for asteroids <clears throat> that might come and hit the Earth, they need the early part of the night, and that's exactly when this problem is worst. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, and so, we are worried that yeah we can pro it's going to be a pain in the neck for all of us but it might be really bad and make uh, for this particular kind of science looking for asteroids near the earth uh that's really important right because we want to find if one that might hit us uh mm. i mean we don't want to find one that might hit us but if there is one that might hit us we want to find it uh and we want to find it you know 100 years early when we have a chance of, of mm. uh, diverting it and avoiding it. So, so that science is going to be the most impacted, we suspect. And we're kind of, you know, we're always going on calculations here because, yeah, the couple thousand satellites that are up right now are a pain in the neck, but they, they frankly, they aren't disastrous for us yet. Right. Mm -hmm. It's when we get to the hundred thousand satellites that, that we're really in a mess. Uh, and so we don't, there are probably going to be effects that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, um, 
the other thing that we worry about, right, just for the average person, is how many satellite, how many of these satellites are going to be visible to the naked eye? If mm. you go out at night and look up in the sky, how many are you going to see? And at the moment, that looks like that's not going to be too bad. But again, when you get to the 100,000 satellites, if they're in a very low orbit, and the latest filings are suggesting that a lot of the satellites are going to be as low as 300 kilometers, uh, that's going to make them really bright. And uh, SpaceX have done some modifications to their satellites to make them fainter. Uh, Originally, they were really shiny and super bright, Mm. and now they're a bit Mm. fainter. So that's good. But even so, uh, that and, and you know, there's no guarantee that the other uh, companies and countries will make their satellites faint. And so you could imagine a future in which when you look in the sky, there are more visible satellites than there are stars. Well, can you imagine that? Right. And even maybe worse, right at the level of what you could almost see, you know, the, the, just at the very faintest level, there might be a whole lot of satellites. And so you'll see the sky kind of shimmering mm. in some way that I'm a bit worried is going to be nausea-inducing. So, mm. so you know, that you're, you're really going to affect the visual environment, potentially. It, mm. and, and this is something that, that is very interesting because our analyses that we've been doing show that it is really sensitive <clears throat> to the design of your constellation. And the good news is if you're careful, you can design your satellites so they're probably not going to be so bad for this. Mm. But the flip side is if you're not careful, the technology is clearly there to deploy a constellation that would change the night sky <clears throat> for everyone. Yeah. And that, I feel, is a decision that should not be made by one company or one country. Uh it, it should be, you know, discussed at the UN uh, uh, that even countries that are not active in space care about what they see in the sky. That That's just a staggering thought. And I'm trying to visualize what you said, because I wonder if that would also have an impact on a lot of our uh, wildlife or birds, because a lot of what they do at night or, or, or their flying uh, trajectories are based a lot on uh, what happens above. Right, so right. Uh, that that uh, can change so much. Right, there's various kinds of wildlife that are, you know, use the sky in some way, and we don't understand it too well. Like, you know, mm. are the birds navigating with the sky, or are they using the magnetic field? Um, right. Not entirely clear. Um, uh, are there there are these. Um, uh, beetles that uh, you know seem to orient themselves relative to the Milky Way for their migration, or you know that. So that's the potential for unexpected environmental effects is there. <clears throat> and I don't want to overstate it. It's it's not 100% clear we're going to get to that point, right? Mm-hmm. But but I think, and certainly you know, Starlink probably is not going to be bright enough to do that. Although it's not it's still not entirely clear. Um, but it's not that any one specific company is currently going to do that. It's that the technology is clearly there that if you're careless, you could do that. And, mm. and so we need to think about it and we need to sort of keep an eye out for exactly that kind of unexpected environmental consequence. Right. And you were mentioning that Starlink is at a lower altitude and one web, when it does get deployed, is going to be at a high altitude. Now, for you, uh, observing the universe from where you are, this distance of uh, from from one web to, to, to Starlink, which ones affect you more? Is it the closer satellites or the ones that are much further? Or is it, does it make a difference? It, it does, but not for the reasons you might think. Um, so for professional astronomers, we're uh, more worried about the slightly higher ones, not because mm-hmm. they're closer to the things that we study. The things I study, right, are not a thousand kilometers away. They're a thousand million trillion kilometers away, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, yeah. And so the problem we're having <coughs> is like if you're driving along the road uh, in a rainstorm and there's raindrops on your windscreen 
and you're trying to see what's on the road, but you can't see out because of all the raindrops on your windscreen, right? It's a foreground interference. Uh, and the higher satellites are worse because they move more slowly. Mm. And because they move more slowly, then they leave a, more of a trail on your image. But also, they can be seen from a wider area, right? The higher you are, you know, it's not just this telescope that sees that satellite. It's another one 100 miles away. And worse, because the satellites are higher, they also see the sun for longer. And so when you see these satellites, it's because it's night where you are, but it's still day where the satellite is because the satellite's high enough up that its right. horizon is further. And so it can see the, the sun hasn't set for it, even though it has for you. Right. Mm. And and so that's why uh, the same number of satellites at a, in a high orbit instead of a low orbit is much, much, much worse for astronomy because many, many more of them will be visible, uh, will be reflecting sunlight uh, mm. uh, than the low orbit ones. Right. But if you had, for example, if someone had the coordinates for all these uh, satellites, could you in some way design a program or a software to try to navigate through all of this and, and just switch off and on when uh, a satellite is not passing by? Or is that possible? Well, so so the thing is, um, you know, the way our telescopes are designed at the moment, they're not really designed to switch off for a second and switch on again. Hmm. Right. And so we're we're. Uh, um, and so if you're taking your five minute exposure, even if the satellite only takes a couple seconds to go across, uh, you, you either take that five minutes or you don't. Uh, and so the question is, can you find gaps where you have your five minutes completely clear of satellites? Mm. And so, yeah, of course, we're actually uh, starting to design software now that would let us plan our observing programs to do exactly that. Well, given the information we have about where the satellites are. And that works, we hope, up to a point. But that only works if there are gaps, right? So yeah. if there are a certain number of satellites, maybe you can get away with that. If there are 10 times that many satellites, then, you know, your program comes back going, yeah, no, maybe next year, <laughs> right? It, yeah. it's, 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 there is no gap uh and and so that's that's the challenge we're in um at, at a certain level of number of satellites we can do what we call mitigations in other words uh find ways around it deal with the issue yes it's a pain but you know we can find you know maybe we lose half of our night but we can still use the other half something like that uh, mm. But then if you increase the number of satellites again by a factor 10, those sort of mitigations stop working. And mm. it's like all satellites all the time and you can't do anything. And and so so that's, you know, so so we're still uh, we're still probably in that medium stage of being able to mitigate. But uh, but in, if we don't do something uh, in the long run uh, about limiting how many satellites you can have, then we'd end up in that bad situation where you, yeah, you just can't, you can't solve it. Mm. And you earlier mentioned about something that really hits home where you spoke about probably, you know, telecommunications getting impacted where, uh, well, Donald Kessler and the Kessler syndrome says exactly that, right? Where he theorized that the continuous collisions on man-made objects in space could potentially destroy telecommunications. And I, do you, do you subscribe to that theory? Uh, absolutely yes. Now I want to tell your listeners is it's not like the movie Gravity in which <laughs> I was thinking of that, and then you know half an hour later, right, all the satellites in space are, sh are shrapnel. Um, yeah. it, it it plays out over years and decades, like most environmental problems do, <laughs> right? It's 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 not that fast, but it will happen, and mm. so you. If you are, if you completely ignore the problem, and we're not completely ignoring it, I'm glad to say, but if you completely ignore the problem, then you will get into that situation where uh, Earth orbit becomes unusable, and we lose, mm. you know, international phone calls, we lose tele television uh, uh, broadcasting, we lose GPS, all of that, you know. So, so that would be bad. Um, 
And so right now, where I think we're heading for in the next 10 years, a situation where it's not that bad, but you lose the occasional very expensive satellite to a collision. Uh, and the satellite operators have to spend a lot more money and a lot more time dodging debris, dodging other satellites. Uh, and, you know, yeah, the math maybe says with these internet constellations that you they can avoid each other, but we all know that accidents happen. Uh, and so there are going to be collisions, there's going to be debris. Um, I think it's going to get bad and uh, not necessarily Kessler syndrome bad where, where, you know, you can't use space anymore, but, mm. uh, but something along that direction, you know, enough, far enough in that direction that it's a real problem for us. So, mm. so I think, and I think, you know, again, I keep going back to the analogy with other environmental problems, right? It's going to mm. take a couple of disasters before people actually get off their rear ends and, and do something about it. Mm. Humans and are the, not very good at solving these problems in advance. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the space fence that the U.S. Air Force is working on for to create a virtual fence around the planet, uh, is that something that you think would help? And, and how would that help? Right. Well, it's just, it's actually a fence of radio waves. It's not a physical fence, right? Uh, and what it mm. is, it's a tracking system that will improve our knowledge of who's going where. And that's really important. The first thing you have to do is know how bad the problem is and know where everyone is and where they're going. Mm. But at the same time, however perfect your knowledge is, that doesn't help you if you don't do anything about it. Right. <laughs> Right, you got to do something right. with that knowledge, and yeah. that's the step that we haven't really addressed yet. Mm. How do you define when we were talking about these orbits, uh, the Leo Leo orbit? Is there is there something that is uh, lower Leo and higher Leo as that is used generally? Not yes. Yeah. So Leo is the orbit between about two hundred kilometers is the lower end of most where most satellites are, and about. 2,000 kilometers is the very upper end, okay. uh, and that's low Earth orbit. And then there's not so much stuff until you get up to geo, the geostationary orbit, at 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. Uh, wow. And the reason for that is the radiation belts around the Earth are, are, are much stronger uh, in, in that middle bit, and so you either go low or you go high. Um, now, I have been advocating that we need to start talking about a lower and upper LEO that it's actually a very different environment, that word again, uh, a very different environment below 600 kilometers and above 600 kilometers. Below 600 kilometers, there's enough residual atmosphere that there's enough little bits of air left over that the drag, the, the headwind on satellites is enough to bring them down in weeks to years. Hmm. Above 600 kilometers, there really isn't. Uh, uh, it's really a pretty good hard vacuum, and uh, satellites will stay up for centuries. And so there's a lot more debris up at that high altitude. Um, uh, at low altitude, uh, uh, but the situation isn't changing that fast in the higher part of LEO. In the lower part of LEO, things are changing really quickly. Hmm. Uh, that's where a lot of the constellation satellites are going, the internet satellites, uh, and the environment is getting very crowded there very fast. Uh, and so we're seeing a, a time of dramatic change in this lower LEO and steady but still way too much stuff in, in upper LEO. Hmm. And when you talk about CubeSats and so many private players coming into it, could and as technology gets better or, 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 or streamlines more, is that the reason why lower Leo, like you said, is getting more busy because it's just uh, it's it's easier probably to put stuff up there? Right. Well, also there is a bit of you know people being responsible, right? They're they're uh, often going to lower Leo because if their satellites die, they will re-enter in a few mm -hmm. years instead of staying up there forever. 
Uh, and so people have started realizing this. And so this is a step towards being more responsible. Whereas in the 1980s, people were launching stuff up into Upper Leo and just leaving all kinds of junk there because who cares? Well, it turns mm. out you do care. Uh, mm. uh, so, so that's part of it. If people are not communicating, when I say people, I mean agencies or space agencies, then one group who's trying to do something is always going to be behind the curve because you get to know about it after the event. That's right. And uh, um, I, I do think that uh, we need better communication. Thing. Here's the thing. Space is intrinsically global. Hmm. Uh, you pass over a different country every few minutes. All the country's satellites are you know, going this way and that in the same orbits. There's no American part of space. There's no Indian part of space. And, and so you've got to have communication and cooperation between countries if you're going to use space safely. Now, uh, Jonathan, we were also talking earlier about what you do and the research that you're involved in. Now, we know that you're very involved with the Chandra X-ray uh, Observatory and, and studies there. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do there and, and how this is helping all of us? Right. So my work in, in fundamental astronomy, right, has centered on uh, these very energetic objects called quasars, which are uh, matter falling into black holes in the center of galaxies. And so, you know, why would you care about that? Well, it turns out that um, we're in the universe. We live in the universe. Studying the universe helps us understand who we are, where we came from, and where we might be going. Uh, and also, physics are kind of like the rules of the game of life that we're all playing. Mm. And so when you study a black hole, you're studying the everyday rules that we play by when we go around our, our everyday lives, and you're studying what happens to them in extreme situations where gravity is really strong and stuff like that. So you're like testing them to the breaking point, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so that gives us a deeper understanding of those rules that affect the everyday stuff. And so that's sort of the two motivations. Um, one of the big discoveries of uh, astronomy in the 20th century is that we are all quite literally made of stardust. Mm. Uh, and by studying the evolution of stars, we've, we've figured out why, you know, we, we now understand why uh, carbon and iron are common and gold and platinum are rare, right? That's a very practical thing. Why is mm. that? Well, it turns out it's all due to nuclear reaction rates in exploding stars. And, and we can even understand which elements came from which kind of star and things like that. And so, so we, because we are stardust, because we are part of the universe, studying the universe is studying us. So that's sort mm. of the motivational part. So as part of that, uh, I study uh, x-rays from space. Uh, which are made when things go badly wrong in the universe, right? The, so the Hubble that people have probably heard of studies mm. ordinary light from ordinary stars going through their <laughs> ordinary day, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, but then some of the time things go badly wrong. You have a, a, an exploding star or you have a black hole where stuff is being torn apart. And that raises matter to temperatures of millions of degrees. Mm. And when you heat matter to millions of degrees instead of shining in regular light, it sh shines in X-ray light. Mm. And so the objects I study, the X-rays come from these objects and they travel across the universe for maybe a billion years. And then in the last fraction of a second, they get stopped by the Earth's atmosphere because the X-rays wow. can't get through the Earth's atmosphere, which is, you know, really annoying for me, but good for everybody else because you don't want to <laughs> be you know, X-ray yeah. all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, and so what we do is by going just a teeny bit closer, right? It's not that you're getting significantly closer to the objects you're studying by putting a, your telescope on a satellite. It's that you're putting it above the murk of our atmosphere to where the view mm. is clear. Uh, and it's a bit like the analogy I make is if you've ever, you know, swum underwater in a swimming pool, 
you can't see mm. very far. And then as soon as you put your head above the water, you can see a lot further. And so that's what it's like putting a telescope on a satellite. And so we put the telescope, uh, uh, we put the telescope on a satellite, uh, the Chandra Observatory, named after uh, a famous Indian astronomer, Subramayaman Chandra Sekhar, uh, who uh, moved from India first to England, uh, where he uh, discovered a lot of the ideas that, that we now call a black hole, and then mm. later to America, where he became one of the leading astronomers in the United States for many decades. And so uh, we named this American satellite after him. Uh, and uh, and so Chandra, uh, the telescope, uh, uh, observes uh, these X-rays that are coming from distant parts of the universe that, that let us see the extreme things going on in space. And so I've just been studying a black hole where matter is falling into the black hole. And once it goes into the black hole, right, you can't see it. The black hole's black, famously, mm. right? Uh, but on the way into the black hole, it feels the black hole's gravity and it gets ripped apart. And that's what makes it glow. Mm. And, and so you can see the bright x-rays. And it's it's so the one equation that a lot of people have heard of is Einstein's equation saying that matter can be converted into energy e equals mc squared. Mm. And that is a fundamental uh, rule that we use to, to study how stars shine, uh, that, that you take a little bit of M and you turn it into E, a little bit of mass, and you turn it into energy. And uh, the, uh, the sun uses E equals MC squared to shine, and it takes about a, per a tenth of a percent of its mass and turns it into energy over 10 billion years. Uh, right. And that's, the, that's sunshine. Uh, but these quasars, they take 100% of the mass of equivalent of the sun and turn it into energy every year. So they're incredibly more energetic. And so one of the mm. things I want to understand is how that energy is generated uh, and, uh, and sort of you know, study these insane objects that are putting out so much energy that you can easily see them with your telescope, even though they're a billion light years away. Uh, mm. and, uh, and we can probe what happens as the matter gets close to the black hole and actually see the effects that Einstein predicted uh, uh, in terms of the time getting stretched out and the light getting bent around the black hole and so on and so forth. And so mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're getting both to study this amazing events, uh, uh, to understand the history of galaxies that lead into the history of the earth and how the earth came to be formed, uh, how the elements came to be formed, uh, but also seeing in real time the laws of physics uh, operating in their most extreme situations and, you know, confirming, mm. you know, testing whether Einstein is right and uh, in his theories. And spoiler, the answer always is, yeah, <laughs> Albert was right again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> his track yeah. record is he, really He always good. seems to be right. Yeah, yeah, so far. <laughs> and so, so... Uh, uh, <clears throat> but it's nice to actually be able to see these weird effects happen mm. exactly as predicted. And that gives you confidence in the theory as a whole that we use for, um, you know, the, the, a lot of people don't realize that uh, relativity theory actually is sort of practical applications here on Earth. We were talking earlier about the GPS satellites, how dependent mm. we all are on them. Uh, because the GPS satellites are 20,000 kilometers above the Earth, they feel a little less gravity than us down here at the bottom. And because of that, the time actually runs at a different rate on board the satellite. Mm. Tiny, tiny difference, but it's enough that if you didn't correct for it in the in the atomic clocks on the satellites, your GPS actually wouldn't work. Mm. And so we actually have these very subtle effects of general relativity even here near the Earth, and then near the black hole they're not subtle at all <laughs> they're, they're yeah. huge yeah. and so you can really really uh, uh shake them and, and and see what's going on mm. so uh I, so that's that's my interest in the in, in uh using the chandra telescope all right and you spoke about the black holes in the work that you're doing i think stephen hawking spent a lot of his time as well talking about the event horizon and what happens is that something similar to what you were just saying uh, yes, uh, Stephen worked on the fundamental physics of the black holes, 
uh, I tend to sort of I don't go that far. Uh, I um, uh, uh, I I more look at the astronomical effects of the black holes. Okay. Uh, um, and so he was. I, I actually did you know work in his group back in the day as a as a student uh, uh, in Cambridge, and uh, and that was too hard. That, that was too removed from data for me. Uh, mm. And so I've shifted from that sort of work that 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 he pioneered to the more practical. Okay, we see this thing in the sky, and what does it do? But it is mm. it is intimately connected with the work that he did. Uh, and and yeah, he was an amazing guy. Right. And just when you when you're talking just talking about quasars, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out the the humongous size we are talking about here, right? So people listening to us, uh, when you talk about a quasar. Uh, what distance are you covering? Is it the distance? I mean, they're huge, right? They're talking about a galaxy or, or bigger? Or? Yeah. Well, the quasar itself is, by astronomer standards, pretty small. Uh, mm. The uh, the event horizon of the black hole uh, is only uh, about 150 million kilometers. So the size of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Oh. Um, so I say only, you know, um, yeah. and the, the region around, uh, it, where the gas is that's shining is maybe a few light years. Uh, mm. and, and so it's, it's on the scale of a few solar systems. Um, uh, and there's, and that's one of the amazing things about it. These, you, it's sitting in a galaxy that is a hundred thousand light years from end to end. Well, but it's prov it's creating, it's emitting a thousand times more energy than the entire rest of the galaxy it's sitting in. Wow. So you've got a galaxy that's a hundred thousand light years across, a quasar that's maybe about one light year across, so a hundred thousand times smaller, but it's putting out a thousand times more energy. So it's an mm. incredibly concentrated. Uh, amount of, of energy production and that whole object that galaxy then is typically the ones I study billions of light years away mm. um, so really very distant wow. uh, and so we're seeing it as it was billions of years ago the quasar I was most recently studying I as we look at it today the light uh, that's reaching us left the quasar before the sun and the earth had formed. Well, so you are actually looking at the past, right? That's right. Well, we always are. You know, that's the we thing always we are. Realize. Yeah. You know, if we were in a room together, right, and you were, you know, a meter away from me, I would be seeing you as you were in the past. But only mm. like a nanosecond in the past, and you don't change right. much in a nanosecond, so you don't notice it. Mm. Um, but you can kind of see it on TV interviews, right? When you see, when you watch CNN or something like that, and you see uh, um, someone in Washington D.C. talk to someone in Baghdad, there's a little pause before the person in Baghdad hears them. Mm. That's because of the time it takes for light to go up to the satellite and back down to the reporter. And that pause, you, one way of thinking about it is the the reporter in Baghdad is seeing the anchor in Washington as they were in the past. Mm. <laughs> right? And it's only a second in the past. Yep. So it's just, it's annoying, but it's not problematic. Yep. But it's exactly yep. the same thing. And so when you see the moon, you're seeing it as it was a second ago. Mm. When you see the sun you're seeing it as it was eight minutes ago. So if the mm -hmm. sun went out, if it's daytime where you are, if the sun went out right now, you would still see it in the sky for another eight minutes because what you're seeing is not the sun. What you're seeing mm -hmm. is the sunlight that left the sun eight minutes ago and is just now arriving in your eyes. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's and so everything you see, you see in the past. It's just that normally the things that are close to you yeah. are so recently in the past that you can't tell the difference. Mm. And uh, Jonathan, would you have been involved or, or were you excited with, uh, we did hear about a particular flare that went up, right, centered around the Sagittarius 
Uh, was that interesting to you? Um, yeah, it's not something I was directly involved in, but but yeah, there are we see flares. There's there's an so the for for arcane reasons, the black hole in our galaxy, the big black hole in the middle of our galaxy, is called Sagittarius A star, uh, where the star is like an asterisk because we found something called Sagittarius A, but then that turned out to be boring. But right next to it, there was uh, the, this black hole. That is Sagittarius A with an asterisk, <laughs> and yeah. so Sag A star we call it, and uh, we see in X-rays we see it chomping down on asteroids and flaring uh, as you know a, a burst of energy comes out as the asteroid gets ripped apart, uh, but just before it, it uh, falls into the black hole. Mm. Uh, this has just been a very exciting and very interesting conversation. I know I have limited time. So uh, I do know that you have mentioned in the past that you have been a, you have been a fan of Fred Hoyle, right? Yeah, Fred was, was a remarkable guy too. He, he was quite a character. And he was, Fred Hoyle was one of the leading cosmologists of the mid-20th century. But uh, he, he did not believe in the Big Bang, or, or what, am I right? That is correct. Uh, he had an alternative theory called the steady state theory, mm -hmm. which turned out to be wrong. Um, mm -hmm. Fred was someone who came up, you know, a lot of his ideas turned out to be wrong, mm -hmm. but they were interestingly wrong, unlike most, you know, uh, uh, people who have wrong ideas. And, and uh, you know, Fred would come up with, uh, you know, 10 fantastic ideas a year, nine of which were wrong, <laughs> right? Yeah. One of which any one of us would be happy to base our whole career on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, yep. and so, you know, he was a fantastically creative guy and, you know, but he did get locked in uh, as many of us do to theories that he liked that, that weren't actually supported by the data. Uh, mm. And so, and, and as data came in and it became clear that the big bang was right and steady state was wrong, he, he wasn't ready to give up on it. And he kept trying to to fix it, um, but uh, uh, you know, and that's okay, right? Uh, uh, it's okay to try and fix a, a wrong theory. Um, yeah. uh, it just, you know, because you often learn things about the universe even when you're doing working on the wrong theories. Uh, um, but at a certain point, the community goes, "Yeah, okay, actually, we know the universe isn't like that." interesting theory really you know raised some interesting points but mm. really there was a big bang we know that now mm -hmm. but like you mentioned you know you could as long as you have that curious mind and inspire somebody else because like newton said most of what he he did was standing on shoulders of giants so past work could inspire somebody else to reach where they have and not necessarily has to be the right outcome for you at that moment but, oh, absolutely. Uh, John, and it yeah. turns out that this theory of inflation in the very early universe has some parallels to some of Fred's uh, theories on the steady state. So Correct. it's just been a different scale, right? Is the wrong he, he had the right idea in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, yeah, no, I, I think that, uh, um, yeah, we, we're all inspired by uh, 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 by these amazing pioneers. And I was very lucky in my youth to be to, to be able to meet these remarkable scientists like Fred, like Stephen, uh, who, who, yeah, left me just completely inspired. And, uh, um, you know, I, and in my own very small way, I've tried mm -hmm. to sort of, you know, push forward uh, some of the agendas that they had. Really nice to hear that you did meet them and they did inspire you. And I'm sure that that's what you're doing now to a lot of our listeners, uh, because most of them are university students and kids. So I'm sure they'll be listening eagerly to every word you've said. Uh, there's an interesting article that, or I would say your space report, which you released in August, where you had mentioned, and I just want you to, if you could touch on this, and I'm going to quote, in that spirit, I oppose the proposed change to the dictionary meaning of the word civilian and the phrase civilian astronaut proposed by SpaceX and the Inspiration4 team. Civilian astronaut means non, not active military. Uh, I found this interesting. I, would, I just w wanted to ask you whether you could shed some more light on this. 
Yeah, I'm I'm considering changing the name of the space report to the uh, English usage report with occasional mentions of space. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, so so yeah, this just uh, ticked me off because there is you know uh, they're they're trying to change the meaning of a word for basically advertising reasons uh, mm. and um, uh, you know so. Uh, I don't know what the usage is uh, in among other English speakers, but certainly in American and, and British English, um, uh, a civilian is someone who isn't active military, and that actually has a uh, a legal implication. It's like you know, if you are a civilian space traveler and you land in like North Korea or something like that, you you know whether you're a civilian as opposed to military could determine whether you get shot as a spy uh, under international armed conflict law. Um, and and so um, the, uh, the inspiration for folks want civilian to mean uh, what a, a private citizen, someone who doesn't work for the government. Uh, and that's just a wrong usage of the word. Um, uh, the uh, 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 I'm a civilian government employee. I'm not military. I do work for the government, but I'm a civilian. Uh, and uh, what I'm not is a private citizen. I don't. I work. I represent the, the government at some level. Uh, mm. And so, Inspiration Four is going to be the first orbital flight that uh, is privately operated and has an all private citizen crew, rather than having government astronauts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they are also civilians, but there have been other civilian space flights before. Uh, uh, government employees who were civilians flew on uh, Soyuz TMA-3 uh, and on other flights in the, in the past. And Neil Armstrong was a civilian astronaut. Uh, mm. and, uh, and the U.S. made kind of a big deal of that, uh, that, you know, trying to emphasize that the Apollo program was not a military program. Uh, uh, to sort of as an international politics kind of thing, it was important to them. Uh, that the first person on the moon was a civilian, uh, a government employee, but a civilian. Uh, mm. And so I think because of that historical importance of that argument, uh, changing what civilian astronaut means now is a bad idea. Mm. I think I pulled the wrong switch there, but I'm happy for, for you to have, have the clarification here, Jonathan. Okay. That, was, that was interesting. That was interesting. But uh, Jonathan, before we let you go, reluctantly, we would love to hold you back. And a couple of things for everyone listening, Jonathan. One is, uh, where can people find you, read your papers? What would you uh, direct them towards? Uh, the, your website, I do have it, but I would like to listen to it from you. And uh, what kind of a message would you like to leave students that are listening to you currently and, and are amazed with what they've heard, choosing their careers and deciding to go and which direction should they move on and how should they tackle all these things in life? All right. Well, first, uh, yeah. So if you want to read more about what I do, uh, I have a website, planet4589.org. Or you can just, if you Google Jonathan Space, you'll probably find me as the top hit. Uh, and, uh, and I have a Twitter account, uh, at Planet4589. Uh, it's named after the asteroid that was named after me, Minor Planet 4589 McDowell. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, uh, feel free to ask me questions on the Twitter account. Uh, I always like engaging with, uh, uh, with people who are interested in space. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, you know, uh, I've had an interesting career. I've managed, you know, having been fascinated by space as a kid, I kind of locked onto it like a, a, a terrier locking onto your leg, you know, not letting go. <laughs> and and uh, I, uh, I worked hard in school. I did math. I I. Uh, I even learned Russian so that I could translate uh, Russian space documents. Uh, I prepared myself, you know, very advertently for a career studying space uh, and uh, uh, and just pushed it through. And, and, and I think uh, um, and I've been, you know, really I've had a fantastic, fascinating time. Uh, 
There's nothing like, you know, standing on top of a mountain at a big telescope, being the first person to see this particular galaxy, uh, or standing at Kennedy Space Center watching your experiment go up on the space shuttle. Uh, and so, so it's been a fun ride. And so what I would say uh, um, to young people, uh, uh, boys and girls listening, is, uh, you know, it takes work to get uh, to become an expert in something but it's well worthwhile it's really satisfying uh, and if there's something that grabs your passion go with it Pu push it do the take it as far as you can and maybe you know maybe you succeed maybe you don't maybe you end up but wherever you end up you'll end up a richer person for having gone deep into something and I think it's that that going deep into something, that gives you skills that are actually usable, whatever you end up doing. Uh, so, so um, that you know, follow your passions, work, you know, do uh, and do you know, math and science, and and don't be scared of them. Uh, it's hard work, just like you know, getting a good body by working out is hard work. You have to work up a sweat, but it pays off in the end. Uh, and our life that we lead now in the 21st century is so immersed in science and technology that if you don't have some basic understanding of science and technology it's just all magic to you and that leaves you helpless so just in terms of dealing with the world uh, it's really important I think for every citizen to have a basic mastery of, of uh, math and science so that's my message that's amazing, Jonathan. And once again, from all of us here, from me at Indian Genes, everyone who's listening, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. We've really enjoyed this. We just hope that you've spent your time well as well, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And we really hope we can get you back. We, we quickly talked about quasars, but maybe one day we can have a little bit of a deeper discussion on that, but we can always see how that goes. Sure thing. इस हब हॉपर ओरिजिनल को सुनने के लिए आपका शुक्रिया। अगर आप भी अपना पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करना चाहते हैं, तो हब हॉपर स्टूडियो वेबसाइट पे रजिस्टर करें और एक मिनट के अंदर अंदर अपना खुद का पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करें। यही नहीं, स्टूडियो देता है आपको पूरी आजादी कहीं भी, कभी भी अपना पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करने की सिर्फ तीन आसान स्टेप्स म Simply content.